Thanks to everyone. You did it. NorthSec 2021. We hope you liked it. I know how I had a blast. That last stretch was intense. So first, I'd like to acknowledge the teams that have that ended with more than 100 points. So that's Cold Root, Shopify, DCI, X-Men, Zendesk, Colonel Space Invaders, We Buy Zero Days, Panic au Village, X-Ray Troop, Shared Sec, Okiok, and Gilderous Tigers. Now, I know you're all edging to know this year's winners, but you'll have to wait a bit more because NorthSec is not only a CTF, it's also a lab for a pretty impressive LXD deployment from our incredible infrastructure team. So I'll pass on the mic to the virtual mic to Stefan Graba that has a few things to say about that. All right. So, um... Yeah, I'm, I'm the head of the infrastructure team at, at NorthSec, and we obviously run everything for the for the CTF and infrastructure needed for all the folks um, throughout the year and then during the event. Uh, but we also run things like the public website and all that stuff, so we're a bit of a year-long type thing, uh, a bit different from some of the other teams at NorthSec. So, a um, bit of an overview of, of what we're doing. Um, so, uh, NorthSec is based uh, primarily on Ubuntu, LexD, and Ceph these days, with um, pretty fast uh, networking that's 10 gigabits bounded effectively, using Ubuntu 24 LTS everywhere uh, with the current HWE kernel and live patch. Now, for those who are not very familiar with LexD, LexD is a uh, system container manager and virtual machine manager that's uh, developed by my team at Canonical. So LexD uses that, uh, NorthSec uses that quite extensively and has been for years. It lets us very easily run, you know, well, virtual machine or containers. That's kind of, that's the old, <laughs> the old point of it, but at pretty large scales, including clustering, including advanced networking and storage and all that kind of stuff. So in the case of, uh, of NorthSec, we are running, um, three levels of LexD these days. One level at the bare metal across uh, our eight physical servers. And then on top of that, we're running a bunch of virtual machines and then running a secondary cluster on there that's just used for the, the CTF. And then each team gets their own LexD uh, server that runs the actual challenges. The, um, the things we cannot change this year, so we moved to 2004. We used to be on 1804. So we pretty much redeployed, well, reinstalled and redeployed everything. We changed some hardware. So we used to, to have dedicated machines that would run just infrastructure, infrastructure services. We've now moved to a unified set of hardware that runs both CTF and infrastructure services. Uh, that gives us a lot more resources and um, like maneuvering margin. We can easily move things around. We don't have specialized hardware. We've got less stuff in the rack. So we've been doing that this year. As part of that, we've also, uh, we used to have dedicated machines that would act as the firewalls of everything. Now those are just a bunch of other containers on the infrastructure. So we've got five containers that handle routing and firewalling for everyone. Um, and they interact with each other over BGP, which then gave us some of the advantages um, of, of that uh, to run any cast services effectively. So in, whereas in past years, we would run like two DNS servers, it would give you two addresses, but everyone would always hit the first one and nobody would ever hit the others. Um, this year, we just had a single address, which actually would hit three servers. And that's like completely transparently load balanced inside the infrastructure. If one server goes away, you won't even notice it. And we had like a perfect split between uh, all three DNS servers and all three HTTP endpoints throughout the entire event, um, which really made things a lot simpler. It also means that if we notice something going slow, we can just deploy another one of them and just get some extra capacity that way. So um, again, as far as scale, uh, so each team had up to 20 participants this year. We had 38 Linux uh, challenge containers for each of the teams. We had two Windows virtual machines as well. In total, that means around 854 participants, 88 teams, six physical servers in the infrastructure, as I mentioned, running uh, 50 infrastructure containers. So those are like all of the main services, as I said, DNS, HTTP, the discourse forum, and all that kind of stuff. 
we also had uh, 50, uh, 52 virtual machines that would run the actual challenges. Um, in, and inside those, we effectively had 88 very large containers, one per team, 176 virtual machines. So those are the Windows uh, virtual machines. And then within um, those 88 containers, if you if you count for every single team, that you end up with 3,344 challenge containers running across the entire the entire cluster. As far as hardware, that means 208 CPU cores and 416 CPU threads right now, and we have um, yeah quite a bit of RAM, so just shy of two terabytes of RAM right now. The other thing we kind of changed uh, this this year, other than removing some servers, is that we started moving from Intel to AMD. So I don't know how much you managed to get out of your Windows VMs, but those were actually running on very shiny new AMD Epic servers. So we're starting to move over to that. Those machines give us two CPUs for the Toco, 64 threads each uh, per chassis. We've got two of those, so 256 threads effectively that we can use across those two machines. We also started moving from conventional SATA-based SSDs over to enterprise NVMe SSDs because we were just killing the SATA SSDs too fast. Um, like at NovSec, they would usually die within about a couple of years, which was a bit, a bit annoying. So hopefully the uh, enterprise grid drives will, will fare better. Uh, we're still using our old uh, six Intel servers. So those were actually running all of the internal services and all of the Linux things as well. And, but I said, that's going to be moving away. Um, and we plan in the next year or two to be pretty much everything on the MD Epic. That also has some nice advantages around um, hardware vulnerabilities. Currently, MD is in a bit of a better spot than Intel in that regard. And that's definitely been saving us a bunch of resources by not having to mitigate quite as much as we used to. As far as the remote setup, uh, obviously we were not in person this year. It's the second year we're doing that. So the physical infrastructure was hosted at my place here in Montreal. Um, everything is UPS backed, so if we had some kind of short power outage, uh, it was all fine. The um, public internet was routed over BGP uh, to my home network uh, using effectively two internet connections, one uh, symmetric gigabit fiber, which was the main one, and there was a cable link as fallback in case something would go wrong. As far as what you would connect to, you were actually being load balanced between um, eight different VPN servers. So each of them would handle 11 teams. Again, so we can spread that across the infrastructure and not get the issues we had last year where we just ended up, you know, everything just kind of died at the beginning because the VPN server just hit some kind of kernel issue with too many uh, active neighbors or something along those lines. This year, we had no chance of having that because we were actually spreading that load way better. Plus, we actually had the kernel bug fixed too, so that, that helped. Um, the, um, as far as how you were connected, the teams would actually land in the exact same VLAN as you would if you were on site. So that makes it very easy for us. Like next year, uh, when we're going to be in person again, there's no, nothing weird really. Uh, we can use the exact same setup and just not do VPNs. Um, so what went wrong? That's always kind of an interesting one. Um, so before the event, we noticed uh, a bug in OpenVPN Linux and OpenVPN Windows. There are two different bugs on Linux. It's that it ignores the fragmentation um, command, so it just doesn't fragment. And on Windows, uh, it, so it forgets to set the do not fragment flag on the other layer. So we had to work around both of those issues uh, in kind of different ways by changing configs kind of last minute to avoid really weird MTU issues during the uh, during the CTF. We also found a bug, well, not so much as it. Well, it's an upstream weird design weakness that we had to work around in our NAT64 gateway, which was also kind of hard coding a very low MTU. So we had to bump that so that VPNs would not get needlessly fragmented. During the event, we noticed that Asgot Discourse, which is one of our own piece of software, had a bit of an issue. Um, it was processing posts uh, multiple times in parallel. That's why we had to take, off, uh, take out the forum for a little while at the beginning, because we just had posts showing up like three or four times, which obviously was not good. We also had a uh, Linux uh, soft, lock, soft CPU lockup uh, show up on a few of the virtual machines. We think it was an hardware glitch or firmware glitch that triggered that, but that effectively took out uh, something like 16, 16 teams, which is why we had to suspend the CTF uh, for, I don't know, half an hour or so, I guess, uh, to go and fix that. 
We also found that uh, network D has a bug when you deal with a lot of interfaces. It just doesn't know how to cope with that. And we were losing connectivity as a result. And lastly, a few gotchas we had. Uh, so scheduled tasks uh, not spreading over time properly, which includes uh, log rotate, PHP session, clearing, and sysstat. We're just, yeah, all triggering at the same time, causing a bunch of issues. Q and Q um, VLANs. So if you do VLAN in VLAN, also had some issues with uh, duplicate MAC addresses and our switch is not playing nice with that. So we had to kind of change all the MAC addresses just before the CTF, which was a bit of a pain. Um, and we noticed, I mean, you probably also noticed that one, very high memory pressure uh, would, um, would cause uh, the VFS cache to be emptied, which means that then every single file had to be fetched again from the remote storage, and that would just cause massive load spikes. All right, um, almost getting to, to the good stuff. Um, as far as metrics, uh, we were recording a whole bunch of stuff. We started doing that last year quite a bit. We're doing even more this year. These days, we're tracking uh, statistics on all the physical servers, network, DNS, HTTP, databases, Asgard, and challenges. So anyone trying to brute force a DNS, we usually know it within 10 seconds. Um, same thing with Asgard or anything else. Uh, we're, yeah, we're getting a lot of, we actually run two Prometheus databases now, one just for the CTF challenges, one for uh, the internal infrastructure. All right, so the stats. Um, we ended up reading 103 terabytes of data from our remote storage. We wrote 402 gigabytes, so it's extremely read heavy, uh, obviously. The, at peak, we were doing about 28,000 uh, IO per second from the remote storage. Um, peak write was just 158. The, the issue I mentioned earlier with like the VFS uh, caching was causing quite a bit of load. So we recorded uh, a load of range of 755 at our peak, uh, 271 as far as what the team would have noticed. Uh, we had four teams that didn't show up, which was kind of interesting. Um, and we had a peak of 700, uh, 620 participants connected on the VPN at the same time. As far as public uh, internet traffic, we did really not a lot this year compared, compared to past editions. So um, downloaded 115 gigs, pushed 394 gigs um, to you folks. And for the flags, the, the team with the most duplicates uh, was uh, Zellers in Forsec team with 24 duplicate submissions. And the team with the most invalid flags uh, was uh, CSIC Saint-Jean with 120 invalid submissions. Um, most of our stack and, and tools are open source. They can be found on GitHub. We've got Asgard, it's got Discord, it's got Web UI. Uh, the badge code is there. And the, um, some of the tooling we've got around Lexd is, is all on there as well. And that's it for me. So this was quite a bit longer than usual. Uh, but yeah, hope you, it was useful to, to you folks. And uh, pass it back to whoever is next. <laughs> Actually, it's going to be uh, Serge who's going to talk a bit um, about the next part. Hi, people from all around the world. Actually, we had uh, people from about 25 countries who registered for the CTF this year, which is not bad. Um, I hope you had a hard time. That was intended. A hard time, but a good time. And uh, by the way, you never really get used to it. You just eventually get to enjoy it. So CTF is hard, uh, but that's fine. You just have to uh, start enjoying solving these kinds of this kind of challenge, uh, which leads me to a feeling that I know that a lot of uh, of my fellow uh, infosec workers and just tech workers feel a lot. It's the imposter syndrome, and just want to say that it's normal to feel overwhelmed by this. Uh, there is a lot of stuff in infosec, and you cannot know all of it. So just surround yourself with people that know better than you in many different fields. And this is how, how you build teams and they get to solve these kinds of challenges. So I just want to uh, give a big round of applause to uh, all the team that worked extremely hard. You have no idea the, the amount of hours that were put into it. You just saw the, the little uh, presentation from Stéphane Rabat. We have a team of volunteers that are world-class elite in what they do. And it's a real, real, real pleasure for me to be able to, re to work with them. So if you can uh, right now uh, give 
a round of virtual applause uh, in the, the Discord. Uh, these these person uh, work so many hours to provide you with this kind of experience. So it would be an honor for them uh, to know that you enjoyed it. And also uh, consider doing write-ups. Uh, I know Challenge Designer really, really love to, to see and uh, know how people have solved their challenge, especially if it's in uh, an unintended way, uh, un uninted, you know what I mean, the way that was not intended. So um, thanks again, and I hope I see you in person next year. If you never came to NorthSec uh, in person, it is an extremely interesting experience because it's, extre it's super intense on site. So thank you very much and see you next year. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Serge. Um, so now it's the time to announce the winners, but I know yeah, you might be a bit tired of this. Uh, we have some honorable mentions to, to share with you. Uh, first of all, team Summer Jedi that uh, solved um, the, a challenge uh, in an, quite an interesting way. They used FFmpeg on the Hackers movie to extract all the frames used OCR in them, and they were able to solve seven flags that way. So that's pretty good. Um, besides that, uh, team uh, Hackers in Pajamas had four people use GoBuster at the same time, and uh, they failed their hard drives with 16 gigabytes of logs. So, so that, that created some issues. Uh, shout out to Indy Chixer from Cyber Aegis that streamed our CDF on Twitch most of the weekend. So that was a first for us. And uh, also a shout out to all the teams that try their very best to find what the kind of toothbrush brand was in Hackers. So now, the winners. First and third position with 221 points. Skiddies as a service. In second place, with 223 points, so only two points difference, Hubert's Hacking. And you might have guessed, but in first place, with 243 points, Pwned, the winner of NorthSec CDF 2021. So I'd like to send a heartfelt thank you to all the volunteers that made this event possible. Uh, Serge already touched a bit on that, but for the participants that are looking for a new kind of challenge, we're always looking for new challenge designers. Palm, now, now that you have your first place, I'm calling you out. I expect you to reach out. Thanks all for playing, and we hopefully, hopefully, will see you in person next year. Thank you.